did Jesus live in occupied territory or did he live in God-given land? This anti-Semitism is isolating Israel to where? Think about this, guys. It will isolate Israel so bad, they will have no one to turn to, and then some guy comes out of nowhere and says he will be their best friend. And guess who that will be? The Antichrist. And this is where it's going. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with Pastor Brandon Holdhouse. The stage is being set for the time of Jacob's trouble outlined in the Bible. There is no going back to normal. Jan and her guest have a sobering discussion about our times as the year winds down. Here is today's programming. What the Bible predicts is that this perpetual hatred will then turn itself into last day's events. And then and this rest of the speakers are going to talk about those things. Psalm 83, uh, Gog of Magog, and lead all even through the tribulation period. So what you're seeing right now is the setup for that. And then what's happening is this anti-Semitism is isolating Israel to where? Think about this, guys. It will isolate Israel so bad, they will have no one to turn to. And then some guy comes out of nowhere and says he will be their best friend. And guess who that will be? The Antichrist. And, and this is where it's going. And, and, and so this perpetual hatred that, is, that Ezekiel talks about, it got turned into a religion called Islam. Okay, So Islam is a codification of this perpetual enmity that the descendants of Ishmael and Esau and Keturah's kids have towards the Jews. So you're seeing something unfold in front of you that's ancient. It goes back 4,000 years. And now, here we are. And it's going to take the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, when he comes back at the second coming, to straighten it all out. That's how messed up it is. It's so satanic and so demonic. Why? Why is Satan involved? Because if he can destroy the Jews, then they cannot call on him for the second coming. The second coming is predicated on Israel's acceptance. Remember he, what did he tell them? You shall not see me again until you learn to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. And, and so, so Satan knows that and he's trying to prevent the second coming. So how do you do that? Wipe out the Jews. How do you prevent all the promises made from Abraham uh, and, and the patriarchs, how do you prevent God from fulfilling those promises? Wipe out the Jews. That's the spiritual answer, guys, of why it's happening. Satan wants to target the Jews and eliminate them so he can call God a liar and the second coming can't happen. Glad you can join me for today's Understanding the Times radio. That was the voice of my guest for the hour, Pastor Brandon Holthouse. And before he joins me, I want to make just a few comments and set the stage. It's been a compelling couple of months here as we wind down 2023. Most thought that the focus of this current year would be, well, there's several options, digital money. How about COVID round two? Expansion of the Great Reset. Another dozen issues that we have focused on during the year and previous years would certainly run to the head of the class for 2023. Then out of nowhere came October 7th, 2023, and suddenly the world was on World War III watch. The Mideast was ground zero. Much of the world sided with a ragtag bunch of terrorists and called them freedom fighters because the world cannot see straight and they consistently call evil good. Hamas has vowed to slaughter Jews again and again and again until Israel is annihilated. And by the way, that has not caused the rabble-rousers to back down. The fact that Hamas and others have promised to kill Jews until there are no more. So one thing is certain, there is a new longing for peace after a couple of months of brutal war. And I want to play one more clip before I bring my guest on. And again, it would be Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And I have so appreciated Mark's weekly updates on YouTube. Just look for Mark Hitchcock or go to endtimes.com. 
Mark here in two minutes is summing up a little bit similar to what my guest Brandon Holthouse said in that opening clip. Israel has had in its 75 year modern history now, 16 different wars or conflicts. Think about that, that's about one every five years. So Israel's modern history is just one long series of conflicts. And then there's ceasefires and there's treaties and there's truces, but they never last very long. But notice as I went through that, they're, they're always mediated or negotiated or brokered by outside forces. But what we see in Israel is just this enduring quest for peace, this elusive phantom of peace. Now, a couple weeks ago, I, the, the video that I did was, was titled War and Peace. And, and, and what I've said here today is kind of piggybacking on what we said there. But what we see today, there's never been such an outcry for peace in the Middle East as we see today. I mean, none of these past wars, because we have now 24-7 uh, uh, television coverage. We have social media. We have, there's, there's global outrage and outcry. There, there's major protests and demonstrations. Millions of people gathering in demonstrations, uh, gathering in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, and the United States. We have global leaders all over the globe calling and pleading for a ceasefire. And so we can see today, unlike any time in history, that the world is ripe for a comprehensive solution to this Middle East peace crisis. Again, the, these are always negotiated by outside forces. You know, the, this most recent ceasefire is by the U.S., Qatar, and, uh, and, and Egypt. And that will be true in the end times. The Antichrist will rise from a reunited, revived Roman Empire, from somewhere within the confines of the old Roman Empire. And after the rapture, you can just imagine the chaos. And the act that will catapult the Antichrist onto the global scene is a peace agreement he will broker with Israel. And it will even include uh, the Temple Mount area. So he's going to be hailed by the world. He, you, can, you can see today that anyone can solve anyone that can solve that mess over there would be would be you know hailed as a world savior. And so the world stage is set for his arrival, especially this condition in Israel and just the global outcry and outrage we've seen over this. And all that remains is for the rapture to take place. And the rapture can happen at any moment. And we need to live in light of that day. Joining me to discuss some of the prominent issues of this current year, Pastor Brandon Holthouse, Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California. And in November, he presented a, and I watched it, a moving conference called The Truth About Israel. We'll talk about that and a lot more this hour. And he's raised, I believe, almost $200,000 for the needs in Israel. And he's just back from there. Welcome, Brandon. Hey, Jan. Thanks for having me. Before we get going, I want to ask you a question. I asked Mark Hitchcock this question. This would have been five, six weeks ago on air. Could this whole Israel controversy, and it is a controversy, could it be the next big divider in our church? Because churches have lined up in a couple of categories, very tuned in, praying, keeping people informed, versus those that are choosing to ignore the ordeal of the last two months and thus my questions, which I posed to Mark and now to you, could this be the present church divide? Absolutely. It's interesting you say that because back last summer, I was with Billy and Tom in Mexico. We're doing a conference together and we were speculating, hey, we saw the COVID thing and the shutdown thing was a divider. Do you think the church is going to go through another divide? And we all agreed, yes, we do. But we didn't know what it would be. That was back in July, we were surmising, and so here we are, and the next divider is this issue of Israel. There is no doubt in our minds, and I've talked to all, all the guys in the prophecy world, including you, and we've talked about this off air, there is no doubt this has become another dividing line in the church. We're seeing things in the church be revealed that we never thought we would see, a deep-rooted anti-Semitism. We expect that from the replacement theology types. Mm -hmm. But then what really surprised a lot of us is in our own camp, the pre-trib, pre-millennial camp, we started seeing that come out in those people as well. There's no doubt this is another dividing line, and this is a thing we don't return back from. I think God is doing this for a reason. He's lifting the veil off of the church and saying, this is what it really looks like. There's no neutral ground, and a lot of churches choose to not take a stand. We had gender issues, gay marriage, 
now Israel, and you and I and others have been saying we have to take a stand, but many don't want to take a stand. They're really afraid to take a stand. Maybe it's going to cost them church members. I don't know, but they just are afraid to take a stand on these crucial issues. And I think it's a form of apostasy in this sense. It's called theological reductionism. The common parlance that we all use is you got to teach the whole counsel of God. What's happening is theological reductionism is, well, you hear the phrase, we're only going to teach the gospel. That has been a cover phrase for those who do not want to teach the whole counsel of God. Because if you do teach the whole counsel of God, you have to address gay marriage. You have to address the 52 genders that society says. You have to address critical race theory. And then you have to address the issue of Israel. And what we're seeing is because of this theological reductionism, they won't touch on any issue whatsoever that's controversial. And so they think they're going to take a state of neutrality. But there is no neutrality on these issues. It's a black and white issue. As far as Israel's concerned, as far as gay marriage is concerned, as far as two genders that the Bible presents. And these cowards think that they can escape into neutrality and not lose their congregation, not lose the money coming into the coffers. Will they have another thing coming? Because spiritually, they're not preparing people and they're doing a disservice to the believers in the church. And they're going to have to answer for it one day. The problem is the demonic world knows something is going on. They're stirred up, and there's no neutral ground when it comes to the demonic world. So we have to push back, but pushing back on the demonic world, you got to know what we're doing and being silent. What that saying, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. You had in mid-November the Truth About Israel conference, just outstanding. And folks, you can still access that online. Brandon, what's the best way for them to access this Go to our website, rockharborchurch.net. It's right there on the front page of our website. It's the Truth About Israel Prophecy Conference, and you can stream that for the next several weeks, and then after that, it will be available as a digital download. You're going to hear the best of the best. It was excellent. I couldn't tell you who my favorite was. Maybe you, because I'm a little prejudiced. We had a great cast of speakers, no doubt about it. You raised, not just that day, but in ensuing weeks here, you've raised almost $200,000. And what my audience doesn't know is you are just back from Israel because you went over there to deliver the goods, deliver the financial gifts that you had received, and you also went over there for some other reasons. I don't think that my audience understands the state of Israel as we speak. In other words, they're a kibbutzim, heavily in the south, but really in the north too. Nothing's being done on them agriculturally. Some of the crops are even rotting because those workers, sad to say, were killed back on October the 7th. And so some are going to Israel. You went over here in the last week or so. Talk to me a little bit about this. So what's happening on the ground there is, like you mentioned, the farms. There's no one picking the crops, no one milking the cows, because a lot of them were killed during what Hamas did. They have a lot of agricultural needs, and so a lot of what we were doing is picking fruits and picking vegetables just to help the food supply in Israel, because that's virtually stopped. And the other thing we were doing is delivering meals to displaced Jewish families. I can't remember the exact number. I think there's been 250,000 or 300,000 displaced families from not only the Gaza, but the northern area. And we were delivering meals to them and meals to the IDF. We were also supplying the IDF with tactical gear that they need and a lot of warm clothes and bulletproof vests. A lot of the reservists don't have bulletproof vests, helmets, flashlights, night vision goggles, night vision sights to help the IDF out because the reservists don't have that. And there's like over 300,000 reservists over there that they called back. They have enough for their active military, but they didn't have enough for the reservists. That's what we spent a week doing is helping these guys We raised that money, and for example, we bought a whole unit of 160 IDF soldiers' rain jackets because it's raining now, it's cold, and they're out there in the weather. And so we were able to purchase that and get that delivered to that troop that needed it. As we did that, it's opening spiritual doors to the IDF and to the displaced Jews because they cannot figure out, why does all the world hate us, but you particular Christians— actually came over here and are supplying us with food, supplying us with clothing, supplying us with IDF needs. Why do you do that? The great thing is we've been able to witness to that. And you were in cooperation with some Messianic believers. Help us understand that. 
We're in touch with two organizations that we're working with in Israel. One is Merkatz Netiva, and they're a nonprofit organization, they're a messianic organization. They train their youth in apologetics that when they go into the IDF, they can be witnesses to the unsaved Jewish soldiers in those units. We're working through them, and so what happens is we give the food, and these Messianic believers in these units are the witnessing tool for us in the units, and they explain why we're doing what we're doing, and what's happening is a lot of these IDF soldiers are shook up about what happened. They're really searching, and these Messianic believers are able to witness saying, this is what's going down, and these Christians are doing it because of Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. So we're working with them, and then another organization is FIRM, and FIRM is called the Fellowship of Israel-Related Ministries. They're the ones that we go with, and they bus us around in the Golan, in the areas of Tel Aviv, and even down south to get to the units, to get to all these different places of displaced Jews, displaced families, to help them out. So those two organizations we've been working with, and what they're saying to us is all the Christian ministries left when the war happened, but you guys are coming over and helping us. Why is that? And it's been a lead-in to explain the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, to them. I have said for weeks that God is going to work good out of what Satan meant for evil in the last couple of months now, and I played a clip last week of Amir Sarfati talking about how a new spiritual openness in Israel is happening due to the horrors on and after October the 7th. We all know that the Jewish people are heavily secular. Many are into the mystical, the new age, which almost anybody over there will acknowledge. Many of them have turned their back on the Bible. Brandon, there was that rock concert in the desert back on October 6th, 7th. They had a giant statue of Buddha. I don't know what they were doing with the giant statue of Buddha, but it was indicative of spiritual vacancy amongst the youth of Israel. I mean, look, they've been pushed to the back of the wall, and all they can do is ask questions at this point. Yeah, as we see the birth pains of what Scripture indicates, Daniel chapter 12 says the main purpose of the tribulation period is to break the power of the holy people. That breaking, all of us had to be broken to come to faith in the Messiah, obviously. We had to get to the end of ourselves and realize, hey, I need a savior. And I think that's what you're starting to see is that the massacre was so barbaric, so uncivilized. Everyone probably knows how graphic it was, but it has shocked them, many of them saying, how can people act this evil? But what that does, it's allowed them to see, yes, this is not human. It is demonic. Mm -hmm. It is satanic. And it has allowed us to be able to witness to them saying, yes, you're right. There is something spiritual going on that's bigger than just humans. And it's led the way of us working through these messianic believers of saying, do you want to know why Satan has it in for you? He wants to destroy you so that you will not be saved, so that God will not make good on his promises to you. And it's opened their eyes. Now, again, it gives them that answer, and they're processing it right now. But the fact that they're processing it now is a big opening spiritually. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Bakersfield, California, Pastor Brandon Holthouse, Rock Harbor Church, rockharborchurch.net. That's where you can access that wonderful conference I was able to watch, The Truth About Israel, Israel and Prophecy. I'll give you the lineup of speakers. I know it was Tom Hughes, Brandon, it was Billy Krohn, David Tall, Olivier Melnick. Am I forgetting anybody? I'm going by memory here. Bill Koenig. Bill Koenig, Bill. of course. Great lineup of men who really, really understand the times. But you know, Brandon, what you're sharing with us is so encouraging. And after two months of gloom and doom, and that's kind of an understatement, hearing good news is incredibly refreshing. But I've got to bring us back to reality here and have you and I discuss the detractors who are, quite frankly, haters. And in some cases, they're haters in the name of Jesus. There's one fellow, I think I'll just play a clip of him and we can talk about it, but a lot of people listen to this Mike Adams, so-called health ranger. He gives me bad health just listening to him. Israel now tells us that after destroying northern Gaza, 
they now have to go destroy and bomb southern Gaza. And they're saying that that's because, well, some Hamas escaped from the north and they made it to the south. So now they have to just bomb the south into rubble. Look, this, this is a demolition, pillage, and a land seizure campaign by Israel. That's all this is. They're bombing and bulldozing Gaza in order to push out the Palestinians and steal the land and take control over the natural gas resources and oil resources and take the land. That, that's all this is. It's part of this nefarious aim to achieve greater Israel by any means necessary. And understand that the excuse that they can state at any time is, well, Gaza escaped to X and whatever X is, then we're going to bomb X. Oh, Gaza escaped to Lebanon. Oh, we got to bomb Lebanon. No, Gaza escaped to Egypt. Oh, we're going to have to bomb Egypt. Gaza escaped to Jordan. Well, we're going to have to attack Jordan or Syria or whoever. I mean, th this, this is insane, especially when they say, well, Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has to defend itself by aggressively, offensively attacking Beirut or, or Cairo, for that matter. I mean, th this is not defense. This is offense. And it's, it's just intellectually dishonest to claim, well, Hamas might be at the place we want to bomb. Imagine that. So we got to bomb it. We got to attack. Hamas might be there. Hamas escaped there. Of course, Hamas was created by Israel. You know, Netanyahu's government funded Hamas. And now you understand why. Hamas is the, the boogeyman. It's the boogeyman they need to justify all their actions of aggression against their neighbors and to slaughter the Palestinian people, steal their land again and push out the Palestinians and then claim, you know, victory for Israel. There are others, Brandon, there's Stu Peters. They go on and on and on, these rants like this. What's sad is Christians are buying into them. Christians don't seem to have the discernment to understand that most of what these guys say, it's a bunch of lies. It's unbelievable. My head is spinning after hearing him yeah. talk like that. That's just word salad. He doesn't know history. He doesn't know what's going on. So either the guy, Mike Adams, is willfully ignorant or he is evil. I'm sorry. That's anti-Semitism. To state those types of things, which is nothing but a bunch of falsehoods, so either that's willful ignorance or he is anti-Semitic well, because— They're proliferating on the Internet. That's where they prosper. You and I have talked about that. No one holds that guy accountable. That's the problem we've had. They're not at a church. They don't have an authority structure, so they right. can spout off anything they want on their little YouTube channels, and then all of a sudden they can say crazy things and lead thousands of people astray. This guy's not a pastor. He doesn't know the scriptures, nor does he know the history he doesn't of know the Middle history. East, and he's just spouting off things he doesn't understand. I think the thing that's been most shocking, Brandon, has been the proliferation and the passion behind this Israel derangement syndrome that has gone on, not just online. Obviously, we've seen it in every capital of the world for the last two months. I'm wondering if that caught you off guard, too. It did a little bit. I wasn't suspecting it. I've always known there's an undercurrent of anti-Semitism. But it's like when it happened, they didn't try to hide it. This includes Christians, too, which was a little bit of a shocker of how they totally ignored them killing 1,200 exactly. innocent civilians and immediately went on the defensive of Hamas and went against the Israel government. And it's like, wait a second, how are you not factoring them putting babies in ovens and cutting people's heads off? How did you miss that one? But I think that goes into a spiritual issue. We got not only unbelievers that have spiritual issues, but we have Christians now that have spiritual issues because of wrong theology that they were taught. Mm -hmm. Whether they're getting their theology from the internet or some lunatic pastor that's anti-Semitic, I don't know. But I'm shocked of the level of anti-Semitism in the Christian community. Yeah, yeah. And it reminds me of 1938. I feel we're back in 1938. Neither you or I were around in 38, but it's looking awfully hauntingly like the 1930s and the 1940s. Brandon, you have put together a church finder at rockharborchurch.net. I've got just a minute or two left in my part one of my programming, but I know you chiseled that down from maybe 1,500 churches down to 300 churches. And again, these are those that you safely feel you can recommend around the country. Explain a little bit, at least how you had to pare these down and what's left. 
One of the things is we went from 1,400 to 300, Gideon's army, so to speak, because we ended up calling these guys and asking them, hey, where do you stand on these issues? And we did ask them, where do you stand on Israel? And if they didn't answer correctly, we dropped them. And if they weren't willing to take stands about talking about whether it's gay marriage, whether it's the 52 genders out there or whatever issue there is that needs to be discussed, we drop them. Because we consider if you're going to be silent at this point in time, we don't want you on our church tracker. We do not want to send remnant believers to churches who think they're going to be neutral on these issues. So we dropped them and we got it down to 300. And we're talking about like black and white issues, Jan. Like, do you come out against abortion? Do you Mm -hmm. talk about it? Do you talk about the sanctity of life? If they didn't, we dropped them those kinds of issues that we're thinking the church is supposed to be the backbone of a society. They're supposed to be the moral anchor of a society. And if you can't do your job and you're going to hide behind, well, we're just going to teach the gospel, which I know is just a cover of not teaching the whole counsel of God. Well, then we're going to drop you because we don't see you as a remnant church any longer because you're not helping the remnant. So you can find that at rockharborchurch.net. You label it, is it the church tracker or finder? Church finder. You can go on resources and find that and then click your part of the United States. And we're now expanding into Europe and different places like that. See if there's one by you. Folks, when I come back, I know there are a lot out there who think that we are going back to normal. If we can just get over the hurdle of some of the challenges going on now that everything's going to get back to normal in 2024 and Our fall election next year will turn the world around and all that. Well, maybe we'll see. But what is the Biden administration doing with the Mideast crisis, making it a whole lot worse? I can guarantee you that he and his compatriot, Mr. Winken and Blinken, are absolutely creating catastrophe for Israel. We'll talk a little bit more about that when I get back. So don't go away. We'll be gone for just a minute or two. Jerusalem. Over 3,000 years ago, when King David made Jerusalem the capital of the Jewish people of Israel, there was no Palestinian people. When King Solomon built the first Jewish temple in Jerusalem, there was no Palestinian people. When the Babylonians broke through the city walls of Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple, there was no Palestinian people. When the Romans destroyed the second Jewish temple in Jerusalem, there was no Palestinian people. When the Roman emperor renamed the land of Israel Palestine as a way to punish the Jews, there was no Palestinian people. When the Byzantians, Arabs, Crusaders, Malmuks, Ottomans conquered the land of Israel, even then, After World War I, when the Allied powers divided the territories formerly controlled by the Ottoman Empire and recognized the right of the Jews to their homeland and gave the Arabs the rest of the land in the Middle East, there was no Palestinian people. When the Jordanians occupied the eastern part of Jerusalem after Israel's War of Independence in 1948 and ruled it for 19 years, no one called to establish a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as a capital because, all right, We think you get the point. But then, in the 1960s, out of nowhere, a Palestinian people emerged. But from where? Here's a quote from Zuhir Muqsan, a senior member of the Palestine Liberation Organization. There's no such thing as a separate Palestinian people. There's no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians. The Palestinian identity exists only for tactical reasons. The creation of a Palestinian state is a new instrument in our ongoing war against the state of Israel and for the purpose of our Arab unity. In short, Jewish history has been appropriated. The name Palestine, which was given by the Romans to the land of Israel 600 years before the Arab conquest of the region, was appropriated. There is a concerted effort to erase Jewish history and to delegitimize the state of Israel. Don't be fooled. Learn the facts and share the truth. Welcome back. I'm so pleased to have Pastor Brandon Holthouse on air with me this week. And he's just back from Israel with a mission of mercy. He delivered funds and all sorts of other things to Israel last week and has remarkable stories to tell of how God is, in fact, moving. I have said from day one, God would work good out of evil. But I've also said from October 7th, really before then, but surely when that day hit, that the genie is out of the bottle. Evil has been emboldened. And folks, we are not going back to normal. The birth pangs are intensifying. The world loves Israel derangement syndrome. They're having virtually an orgy in every capital of the world, enjoying every minute of their derangement syndrome. So I don't think we can just assume that 
that kind of a demon is going to go away quickly because that kind of a demon absolutely will not go away probably ever now. And Brandon, you told me that your church sign, which is digital, has been defaced by vandals, correct? That's correct. We're probably the only church in Bakersfield that's flying the Israel flags. Then on our digital screen, we have we support Israel signs rotating through our digital screen. And somebody came and wrote in Arabic something on our screen, because I can't read Arabic, but they spray painted our digital screen. And that digital screen is like a $100,000 screen. Even down the road from us, they spray painted pro-Palestinians. We've gotten calls from people saying, take down those Israel flags. So we're getting a major pushback. We had signs made for our people in our congregation to put in on their yard saying, hey, we support Israel. A lot of those signs were thrown away, trashed, anti-Semitic slurs were put on them. And here we are in Bakersfield getting a pushback with anti-Semitism. I believe that to be true. I really do. We are trending towards the tribulation for sure. The man of peace, peace treaty, the man with a plan is surely wanting to come on the scene. The great disappearance is going to happen first, of course, as the believers are taken out of this mess. And you and I have been talking a little bit, too, and I have headline after headline after headline that's talking about the Biden administration and what they're doing to Israel. And I know Israel's grateful for the show of force off the coast of Israel, in the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and other places. By the way, at the same time, our troops getting pounded in Syria and Iraq, and Biden's doing virtually nothing about that either, but kind of criticizing Israel, wanting her to pull back, wanting her to let Hamas and the other terror organizations just leave them alone. Your thoughts on that, Brandon? What you're starting to watch is Israel is becoming isolated. America speaking out of both sides of her mouth, the Biden administration at the same time says it supports Israel at the same time and freezes $10 billion for Iran, who is behind Hezbollah and Hamas. And you're thinking, what is going on here? And then at the same time, Biden administration is dictating to Israel how to fight this war against Hamas and Hezbollah and telling them, look, if you don't do it our way, we're going to hold back some of the weaponry that we deliver to you, and especially those bunker busters, if you really want to get them in those tunnels, we will hold back on that if you do not do what we tell you to do. And so the Biden administration forced the ceasefire when that should have never happened, and that allows Hamas to regroup and prevents Israel from eliminating Hamas. But the Biden administration doesn't want that. They want a two-state solution, and they want to appease Iran. So Israel is in a predicament now. They need our weapons, but then we're telling them how to fight. And this, again, is a birth pain. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's a sign of the times of the Gentiles that Israel does not have its own self-determination, that it has to rely on other outside Gentile nations for its survival. And that's exactly what's predicted. And that we know that the times of the Gentiles don't end until the second coming. So Israel is being put in this predicament again. Why? It's a birth pain. We don't come back from this. Israel doesn't come back. It's going in a direction to where Israel will be in the crosshairs of every nation, which is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, and eventually will turn to someone that says, I'll protect you. I'll prevent you from the overflowing scourge and being invaded, and I'll be your friend, and that will be the Antichrist. So that's where this is heading. The son of Hamas is warning us about a global jihad, not just a regional conflict, a global jihad. And he says, folks, wake up, because if you don't deal with this now, you are next. If Hamas is not defeated, if Hamas is not eradicated in Gaza, we will set the model, we will give the freedom to so many radical groups around the world. And this is just a warning. If you really care for the global security, and I speak as a person who was part of the counterterrorism effort against radical Islamists, if Hamas is not defeated in Gaza, it will inspire many groups around the globe they will see that few thousands of savages can black, bla blackmail the international community, the superpowers, and bring democracies to their knees. 
Many of them are watching now. And many of them are very happy about how the world is responding. And many of them are satisfied to see the state of confusion and fear and anxiety. This is the time to get united. Because if Israel fails in Gaza, all of us, we will be next. And that's the son of the founder of Hamas, Mossab Youssef. He did convert to Christianity at one time. My understanding is he may have left that now. Your thoughts on that, Brandon? All he's doing, he's warning us of global jihad. Look, you're next. Let Israel do its work for you. And how many times have we heard with Iran saying that Israel's the small Satan and the United right. States is the big Satan? We've heard that on the infinitum. And I think what's going on is a naivety towards Islam. We have been hoodwinked by the radical left saying that this is a religion of peace. It's not. Because everywhere we see this religion spread, it takes over in a very hostile way, bringing in Sharia law, violation of human rights all over the planet. The number one persecutor of Christians in the world is Islam. And it's the number one persecutor of Israel as well, because Islam in its doctrine, holds that it will eliminate the Saturday people and then the Sunday people next. So what's happened is this naivety. Look at immigration in Europe. Islam has taken over London. It's taken over Paris. It's taken over all these different European countries that are now Islamic. London is called Londonistan. I was in Germany recently with Tom Hughes and Billy Crone and Ken right there on your staff. I was in Frankfurt, Germany. I got out of the railway and into the middle of Frankfurt, and all I saw was hijabs and Muslims. I didn't see German people. I thought to myself, what happened? Well, it's called the Great Replacement, what happened in Europe. And what's happening in America is the same thing. We had unvetted people coming in, establishing enclaves and Muslim Sharia law places, and they're virtually taken over. Also, we knew back in the Obama administration that the Muslim Brotherhood had infiltrated into all the way to Obama. And now they're still with us. They're still pro-Hamas sympathizers in Washington, in the Biden administration. Phil Haney uncovered this. Yeah. Jan, Phil Haney was a good friend of mine. He was going to write and a mine. book and uncover all of this, and he got murdered for it. You and I had lunch with him a couple of weeks before that happened. Yes, and he was going to reveal this. And so this threat of Islam and a global caliphate is a legitimate threat that I think since 9-11, we've been naive to this. Well, I think the key might be appease. We can appease them. Israel thought that she could appease her neighbors in Gaza and other places. And I am concerned that she thinks she may be appeasing them in Judea and Samaria as well, the West Bank. And that's going to turn out to be another worst case scenario here. I pray that I'm wrong. But when you think you can make peace with barbarians, you pay a terrible price. Jan, just my insiders on the ground in Israel that I talk to, that part of the IDF, what they're saying is the policies towards the Palestinians and Hamas and Islamic Jihad and all the rest of them have been one of, if we just treat them nice, they'll treat us nice. If we give them work visas and allow them to work in Israel, then that will increase their economics and they won't have the desire to kill us. And it's like, no, you don't understand the fundamental nature of man who is sinful, number one. And then with an Islamic religion that fuels the fire of that, you can't appease evil. Then you have a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what they were telling me on the ground of the security failure that happened when Hamas attacked. They said it was because of our government's policies towards Hamas, towards the Palestinians, towards Islamic Jihad. To think that we can appease them and then they will act in good faith is crazy. Here's how they do act. This is a clip. Now, the media and others, even some in Congress, have now seen the 45-minute video of the atrocities. This is a couple-minute clip here of those responding to it. I'll never be the same person again after watching what actually took place over there. The brutality, the inhumanity not treating people like they're humans. My mother is a Holocaust survivor, and 
I don't wish her to watch this movie. I was in Israel for a few weeks. I visited some of the sites, the families, but to see that the footage, raw footage, in one reel, it's a stab in the heart a thousand times. There are people that say that that didn't happen. I wish the people who said it didn't happen can watch what took place. You can't make the stuff up that we just saw. It's the most inhumane, brutal thing I've ever seen literally in my entire life and I ever will see in my entire life. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's cruel. It's surreal that people can be so disconnected from what's going on because we, what we've seen here today is uh, Holocaust number two. There is a repeating of the ISIS. It's a repeating of Hitler time. And every person that was here, hopefully, will be the angel to make the difference and to just to wipe Hamas from the earth. And United Nations and the head of the UN better wake up and wake up now, because he's not a diplomat, he's a politician. We're in the halls of the United Nations. I feel like we're in the halls of the silent nations. The leaders of the world, the conscience of the world needs to wake up. This cannot be the silent nations. It needs to be the nations with moral clarity that call out this darkness and eradicate evil. We need to bring light to this world. And bring light to the world. And that's why they're releasing the video in very short little doses. Yeah, I mean, everyone keeps asking me, what's the best way to describe the type of footage that we saw? In American culture, probably international culture, you see the kids and they always are having their phone out to post on Instagram, TikTok, yeah. their daily life. Or if they're on a jet, they're, you know, they're on the beach and all that. Replace that with killing. That was Hamas. This was their prized possession. They wanted to show the whole world. They wanted to show their families. So as they did their brutal acts, right. um, they were celebrating. There were smiles on their faces. All young men, too. They looked no more than 18 or 19. And they're happy about it. They're calling their parents about it. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. They don't know, but that's really who they are wishing would come and put some salve on top of the wounds. Any thoughts, Brandon Holthouse? We talk about the silence of the United Nations and all the nations around this, and even a certain group of populists in our colleges and universities. When you lose your moral anchor, when you do not have a Judeo-Christian ethics and morality in your heart, you cannot spot evil anymore. And you cannot even call it out anymore. That's what's going on with our world is this was heinous. This was demonic, as brutal as you could possibly imagine. And they're silent. They can't condemn it. Rashida Tlaib can't condemn it. So that shows me that person has no moral anchor. And that's been the big problem globally is Satan has convinced people to depart from the Judeo-Christian ethic and turn into a relativist and have no moral absolutes whatsoever. And when you do that, you can't spot evil. Yes, I totally agree. Here's more of a bright spot so that we can wind down our discussion a little more optimistically here. I have a headline in front of me. By the way, I'm talking to Pastor Brandon Holthouse, rockharborchurch.net, if you want to dialogue with him about anything. He's just back from Israel. He took a gift of money over there, over $200,000, and much-needed equipment for some of the IDF soldiers. Been on a mission of mercy in Israel for the last week, and I'm just so grateful. I'm almost breaking down in tears. Article I have in front of me, headline, Dear Diaspora Jews, It's Over. I can't read it, but I can read a paragraph. The past month has reinforced my belief that there is one place we're meant to be, and it isn't New York, Buenos Aires, or London. And then the author writes, and I believe this was in the Jerusalem Post, he says, Generation after generation, Jews were expelled from their homes, shoved into ghettos, and murdered at will. Nothing our ancestors did could change that. Jewish communities today need to come to the same realization. This is not and never has been a question of allyship or education. Anti-Semitism is not an enemy you can defeat with well-funded and cleverly planned campaigns. The game is up. It's over. And then he goes on to conclude, for some, moving to Israel now might feel like giving up. I can understand why. He goes on to encourage what must happen now. He says, moving to Israel is not giving up. It is an embrace of the Jewish identity and unapologetically declare that as Jews, we are choosing to direct our energy towards helping our ancestral homeland point of the article, Brandon, is Jews ran to the Western world a long time ago, 
again, New York, Buenos Aires, London, all sorts of Western capitals, they're waking up and realizing it's not safe anywhere. It might be better that we go back to a location where they may be cutting heads off, but it's really safer there than in the diaspora. And that is a part of Bible prophecy. And why don't we explain how? It's sad, but you're right. It's a part of Bible prophecy that God is going to call Israel back home. And he has been. We saw the Zionist movement in the late 1800s. But why? So if you look at the history of the Zionist movement of going back into the land of Israel, especially from Europe and Russia, it was because of anti-Semitism, where you had in France the Dreyfus Affair, which showed the Jews living in Europe, these people are making things up because of anti-Semitism. And that started the movement saying that the only safe place that we can be is in our own land and creating a state of Israel. And then through Nazi Germany and then the Great Replacement with Islam moving into Europe, many of the Jews have left Europe to go back to Israel. Now, the one thing remains, almost half of the population lives in the United States. Well, if the prophets predict that Israel is going to come back into the land, how is he going to get the Jews living in America back into the land? Because we haven't seen those kinds of levels of anti-Semitism. Well, I think after October 7th that it was revealed what's really happening in America. And I have a pretty good hunch that God's going to bring back the Jews from America the same way. He's going to allow the cover to be lifted about anti-Semitism. And the safest place will be for the Jews is back in Israel. In spite of tragedies like we have witnessed here in the last few months, that's still the safest place. Little by little, they're coming to that realization. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell, talking to Pastor Brandon Holthouse, rockharborchurch.net. Brandon, I'm going back to your conference. You had that on November the 18th the truth about Israel, and so many outstanding speakers, including yourself. And I open part two of my programming here with a little clip about the history of the Palestinian people. It's pretty short. It began in the 1960s. But you gave a summary of that at your conference, the history of the Palestinian people. And I'm down here to a few minutes. I'd like you, if you could, to condense it and explain how this came about, because Israel, right before she was a nation, her newspaper was the Palestine Post. The symphony was the Palestine Symphony Orchestra, but it was all Jews. So it's really confusing for people. There is no such thing as a Palestinian people. They're Arabs. And what happened is the Arabs rejected the Peel Commissions in 1938, and they rejected the Balfour Declaration that forced them to accept a Jewish state. So because of them not recognizing a Jewish state, they rejected the Peel Commissions. Then Britain tried to work out an agreement that would be acceptable to the Arabs and the Jews, and they couldn't work out a deal with them. So they gave it over to the UN, and so the UN in 1947 recommended the partition plan to create two separate states, the Arab and the Jews. The Jews accepted it, but the Arabs wouldn't. They totally rejected it. The UN just did it unilaterally and said, we're going to cut this up, the plan of partition in 1947. They gave 80% of the territory that was the historical land of Israel to the Arabs. And they gave only 17.5% to the Jewish nation. So the Arabs didn't like that. And so they decided to attack Israel in 1948 when Israel that year declared themselves a nation. But in January of 1948, they were attacked. What the Arab leadership had told the Arabs living in this area is to get out. We're going to attack the Jews. We're going to destroy them. And you guys can go back into your territory after the war is done. Well, guess what? The Arabs didn't win. Israel routed them. And Jewish leaders urged Arabs to remain in Israel and become citizens. That's right. They told them, stay here. You don't need to leave. But again, the Arab leadership told the Arabs to leave. So again, they attacked Israel, they failed, and the Arabs ended up with less territory after the war of 1948. If they would have accepted the partition plan, they would have had more territory, but they lost territory in that war. So again, Israel proclaims themselves to be a nation and invited the Arabs to remain in their homes and become equal citizens in this new state of Israel but they would not recognize the state of Israel. So again, after the war, Israel offered some of these refugees to return 
upon the condition of signing a peace treaty and accept Israel as a nation. And they would accept 100,000 refugees. And guess what? They wouldn't. This resulted in the confinement of these Arabs in refugee camps. By April 1st, 1950, the Arab League adopted a resolution forbidding its members from negotiating with Israel. So therein lies what created the refugee status of these Arabs. Early 1960s, the Arab coalition hired a public relations firm, Dudley Anderson Utsi in New York, to change the image from bullies to victim. George Anderson told them they needed to be a victim group and they would need to be perceived smaller and more abused and made, obviously, the Israelis the aggressors. So at Anderson's advice, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was established May 28, 1964, and that was the start date of the Palestinian cause. And since then, Jen, in 2005, the Israelis gave self-governments to the people of Gaza. And in 2007, they elected Hamas yeah. with over 90% approval ratings. They've been doing this for 16 years of electing Hamas. And this is the history that people don't understand. Exactly. It is a bit convoluted, but I appreciate the summary there. And you gave it so effectively with pictures and everything at your conference. It's difficult to grasp. The whole history of the Middle East is amazing. Folks, I want to just give a few thoughts here as I go out of my program. And Brandon Holthouse, thank you so much for joining me for this hour and for what you've just done in Israel. Again, I'm so deeply touched because I'm going out with a few closing thoughts here, folks, because since October the 7th, I have tried to present some of the issues that are relevant from biblical perspective, from a political perspective, and certainly from an eschatological perspective, that is, from the angle of Bible prophecy. And we'll have some holiday programming coming up, and we'll change direction a little bit here in the next few weeks. But I am just one of many who has a broken heart on a new level at seeing so much evil unleashed, and more specifically upon a people who have been a blessing to the whole world. I have been shocked and saddened at the silence, as we've talked about repeatedly here, of some churches and Christian leaders. I have been blessed at how others have come forward to take a stand and to count the costs, including my guest today. Their churches or church signs have been defaced, as Pastor Brandon Holthouse has just related, or destroyed in some cases. And all of those you hear regularly on this program are in agreement that it is, in essence, it's 1938 again. There's no going back to any kind of normal. A genie has been let out of the bottle. And I guess the question is, where will you stand? So I'm going out just reading two paragraphs from our friend Amir Sarfati. He wrote this in his newsletter very recently, and he sums it up so well. The fact that what we are watching is spiritual in nature is proven by the world's seeming indifference to torture, murder, etc., as long as it is against the Jews. Sadly, Amir writes, many within the church have joined those labeling the Jews as occupiers and excusing the actions of the Palestinian terrorists as justified because of their so-called oppression. Some do so under a banner proclaiming that modern Israel is not biblical Israel. And then he concludes, If modern Israel is not biblical Israel, then why is the God of the Bible protecting it from those who want to annihilate its people? The answer is simple. He made a covenant and his name is on the covenant. And by the way, he's made a covenant with you as well, the believer. So I hope that will encourage you and he says of the Jewish people, as long as you see the sun and the moon and the stars, you'll know that there's a nation of Israel that's going to continue to exist and play the primary, the key role in the last of the last days as we rush towards the time of Jacob's trouble. I want to thank you for listening, and we will talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. 
We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. We have a front row seat as history winds down and as God orchestrates all things to fall into place.